This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. For Software Engineering Radio, I'm Elena Salinas. Pete Kuman is the co-founder and CTO of Optimizely. After earning his master's degree in computer science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Pete joined Google as a product manager where he helped launch and grow Google App Engine to more than 150,000 developers. In 2009, Pete teamed up with Dan Siroker to start their first company, Carrot Sticks, an online math game for kids. Less than a year later, Pete and Dan created Optimizely during the Y Combinator Winter 2010 class. Optimizely is an experimentation platform that allows marketing and product teams to test, learn, and deploy digital experiences. Pete is co-author of A-B Testing, the most powerful way to turn clicks into customers. Today, we're going to talk about A-B testing and how to implement it. Pete, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you very much, Adana. Let's begin with what A-B testing is. Can you describe what this means? Sure. So A-B testing is a way to run experiments to make your marketing and product design better. So the concept is really simple. It's been around for a long time. We didn't invent this, but... Uh, let's imagine you have a website and you are using that website to, uh, let's say, solicit donations for a political campaign, uh, for example. Uh, A-B testing is this idea that you can take any individual element on that website and try several different variations, right? Maybe uh, you've got three different headlines and you want to understand which of those resonates most with potential donors. And so each time somebody visits your website, you show them one of those randomly, and then over time, once you've collected enough data, you measure which one actually got more people to donate in that example. So that's an A-B test. So you mentioned it's a way to run experiments, and the main objective is to make this product better. And if I'm understanding this correctly, you're showing different variations, and then based on some metrics that you see you decide let's go with variation b 100 percent that's right so every every experiment uh in you know in in the field of of technology a b testing as well as in science you know starts with a hypothesis right your hypothesis might be i think if i change this headline uh then i'm going to increase my donations by five percent for example and a b testing is a way to test that you know, collect, it, uh, collect uh, objective data and making the decision based on data and evidence rather than, you know, the highest paid person's opinion, for example, which I think is how a lot of decisions get made. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. You mentioned you didn't invent A-B testing. It's been around. What I read is that it used to be more difficult due to lack of suitable tooling. Can you explain what engineers needed to do before to sure. set up an sure. A-B test? So, so I mentioned A-B testing has been around for a long time, and it's it really been around for a long time. So you can actually go back and uh, read about experiments that were run in the mail order catalog days. So companies like Sears would create different versions of their mail order catalog and send them out and then measure you know, the, the number of, of orders they got from each of those versions. And so this idea has been around for, for a long, long time. Our founding insight for the company Optimizely was that this was a, a very powerful technique which had been adopted at large scale at companies like Google and Amazon, but was a lot less common outside of kind of the high technology companies, we believe, because it was so difficult to do. And so uh, it used to be that you needed a, you know, a team of software engineers to run any given experiment. And so uh, what we saw even at, even at Google, where, where the practice was relatively common, what we saw was uh, marketing teams wanting to run a whole bunch of experiments uh, and engineering teams uh, basically not caring, right, and, and being focused on, on their own roadmap and that every experiment that you wanted to run required kind of getting onto the backlog in the engineering team. And, and that friction meant that companies were just experimenting a lot less. Um, and so our original insight was that um, 
you know, if, if you make it easier, companies will run more experiments. They'll make better decisions overall. So we built a product that uh, gave our customers a kind of a WYSIWYG visual editor that allowed them to go in and, and change images and change headlines and do all of this without needing to depend on a team of software engineers to do it. Um, so that was, it was, our first product was really a product focused on non-technical or semi-technical marketers who wanted to run experiments on their websites. Uh, so it's been, it's been nine years since we started the company. We've expanded an awful lot. Uh, we've, we now have a, a, a product called Fullstack, which is targeted much more at product development teams and software engineers to run experiments in their products. Um, we've, we've got a whole range of, of, of tools we offer, and, and our, our goal now is really to help large companies build and scale their experimentation programs. I see. And to understand this a little bit more, and for those that aren't very familiar with it, it sounds like what you're doing at Optimizely is you found this way to generalize how to create an A-B test and implement it. And before, it was more of each company had to do this in-house, and it might not be their priority. They have to build features and things like that. But... If we were talking about those early days, for example, if I have the website that you mentioned for donations and I want to test two different images, how would I just go about doing it? Would I, would I be adding conditionals to my website or have two different endpoints? What are some of the things involved? Sure. So the, we actually, there were a couple tools out there, ready-made tools for A-B testing mm -hmm. before we started. Uh, but both of them required a lot more technical work in order yeah. to build an experiment. And so you would be, uh, you know, in the case of a website, you'd be tagging. You'd have to go in and tag uh, some of the different HTML elements uh, to signify to the, you know, the client library which variation each element belonged in. And so anytime you wanted to run an experiment, you had to go in and re-tag your website. And so that, that alone required the help of, of, you know, the software engineering team. And if we... I mean, I don't know how technical we want to get, so please feel free to stop me. But uh, one of the insights that we had was that um, we that you could accomplish this. You could build an A-B test and execute an A-B test without needing to touch your website code at all. And the way that we did this was uh, we gave folks, as I mentioned, a visual editor. And that would allow them to design an experiment, which we would then encode as a series of JavaScript statements. And those JavaScript statements were compiled into a client library, which would update that library, the contents of that library would update every time a customer changed their experiment. And so what that meant was that we would update this client library so that the customer didn't need to update their website. And they would include this single line include on the page, and then our code would execute changes to the DOM as the page was loading. And that's how we were able to get around this requirement for an engineering team to go in and make a bunch of changes every time you wanted to start or stop an experiment. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see. Earlier, you were talking about starting with the hypotheses in terms of A-B testing. In your book, A-B testing, the most powerful way to turn clicks into customers. I think I saw there's a section of lessons learned from 200,000 A-B tests and counting. And here you talk about different steps to go about starting doing A-B testing and defining this. And you mentioned earlier the hypotheses. In step one, you talk about define success. Can you give some examples of what success can mean, you know, based on previous experiments? Yeah, so um, I think one of the biggest lessons that I have learned is that A-B test experimentation is not just a matter of throwing a bunch of stuff at a wall and seeing what sticks. And I think it's a shame because that is often how it's portrayed. But I think organizations that do this really well, one of the things they do is they're really rigorous about coming up with well-qualified hypotheses to experiment on. And a hypothesis is, is really just a guess, it's usually an informed guess, that some particular change will result in some outcome. And that outcome is the idea that, you know, that's, that's your definition of success. And so if we go back to our example before of, you know, I'm, I'm running an organization and, and uh, using a website to collect donations, right? 
the, the success metric might be the number of donations I'm able to collect, right? Or it might be the number of emails that I've added to my, uh, you know, my retargeting list. Every experiment may have a slightly different definition of success. Every organization, right, has a different definition of success. But it's really important before you start going out and testing things to align with your organization. What does success mean for us, right? And then how do we measure that? I see. And even in this area, you just mentioned it's not good to just be throwing a lot of stuff out there and see what works. And I guess that's easy now with with all this tooling, you can just be having a lot of versions out there. What are some of the disadvantages of going by this approach of just constantly releasing, you know, some tweak in the UI or in the workflow and what impact can that have? Sure, so I mean, any change you make, anything you build or do uh, takes effort and time and attention, right? And there's only a fixed amount of all of those things uh, on any team. And so you, there is a need to balance, right, the, um, the desire to test everything and experiment on everything, right, because you are, you are drawing on finite resources when you do that. Um, you know, that's, that's one side. Uh, and then the other side is that, in general, any decision that you make with the benefit of data is going to be a better decision. And so these two forces are kind of uh, coming up against each other. And that's why I think it's so important to emphasize a need for a well-qualified hypothesis, right? It's not, you know, I, I see sometimes every once in a while, although it's less common, stories about changing a button from, you know, red to red to blue or whatever, and, and it, in resulting in some gain. And I generally think those are garbage. You know, I, I, I think, I suspect most of them are statistical noise. Um, and, uh, you know, worse than that, though, they're, they're not informative. They don't teach you anything, and they, they're often not based on any sound insight. So, you know, going back to this, there's an infinite set of things that, that anybody could experiment with at any given time. The thing that you use to narrow that down to something meaningful is your understanding of your customer, your design sense, all of those things that go into making every other business decision still important in this context. I see. Since we're talking about step number one, which is defining success, you mentioned, just a quick recap, some of the metrics for success are specific to your product, right? Like the number of donations, the number of signups to your newsletter or something like that. Is there any other metric that, that you can think of? Oh, sure. I mean, so we've built our product in a pretty general way and we, we try to make it as easy as possible for our customers to measure whatever metric it is that is important to them. And that might be you know, donations or emails collected, as I mentioned in that example. It could be e-commerce revenue. It could be traffic to a particular page. It could be clicks on a headline. So it, it really, really depends on the situation. Okay. Um, Step number two in these lessons learned from running a lot of A-B tests involves identifying bottlenecks. What do you mean by this? Well, um, I think with anytime you're building anything, right, there's, uh, we come to this, back to this idea of, of needing to focus and prioritize your time. And so you can ask this question, you know, I've got, I've got this big website, maybe I'm just starting to experiment. Where should I start? Right, you know? And the idea here is pick the area where there's the lowest hanging fruit. There's the, you know, the biggest opportunity to make a an improvement and one way to find that is just by looking at your analytics right look and and see where your users are dropping out of your funnel and chances are uh, the places where there are the biggest drop-offs there's also the biggest opportunity to make some improvement so if you see that you're getting you know you're getting great uh, conversion rates on your, your 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 Google campaigns and you're getting tons of traffic but then most people aren't getting beyond your landing page uh, there's a good chance that your landing page isn't resonating with your audience, you know, and experimentation is one great way of starting to figure out, you know, how do I fix this? How to make it better? So it's in the end of the day, it's, a, it's really, it's a way to learn about your audience, right? Every, everything that's suboptimal about your business suggests there's something you don't fully understand about your customer. And A-B testing is nothing other than a way to try alternatives so that you can build that understanding. I see. So like you're highlighting the main thing in A-B testing is understanding your users. And by this, 
you should have metrics in place on your website and on your product that can give you the insight of why aren't they clicking that final pay button in the donation website, right? Yeah, it's, it's or, or I think it's, I honestly think it's, it's hard to often arrive at real customer insights using yeah. analytics, right? Analytics, I think, is really great at telling you where the problems are. I don't think it's very good at telling you why those problems exist or how to solve them. And that's really where experimentation comes in. What is the role of user studies and focus groups in A-B testing? Those are both really valuable tools, I think. There's, you know, I, I certainly think that A-B, you can't A-B test your way from a blank page to a successful business. And uh, there are many, many, many things you have to do right to build anything successful. You know, we know. Any way that you can sit down in front of your customers and learn more about them is going to be extremely valuable. And the two that you just mentioned are, are great ones. Uh, I actually, when, often when speaking with early stage entrepreneurs, I will advise them not to run A-B tests, right? A-B tests are a relatively sophisticated way. And even with our software, which I think is fantastic, still a, a fairly high effort way of getting the gains. The gains, I think, are w you know, well worth it. But if you only have a couple hundred users on your website or your app, every month, there's not a lot of benefit in going through the work involved in it. I think as an early stage entrepreneur, for example, you're much better off going out and finding 10 people who love your product and figuring out why they love it, you know, or, or 10 people who hate your product, figure out why they hate it. Um, that kind of in-person interaction is, is really high bandwidth and, and maybe a better use of the small customer base you have. I see. And you, you're mentioning if you have few users, just do an in-person test or something like that. Is A-B testing the answer to scaling those user studies and focus groups in a way? I absolutely think it is, right? A, f a focus group, for example, is a, it's a high bandwidth uh, way of getting information out of a small and not necessarily representative sample, right? So you pick, you know, five people and go and talk to them, and you're going to get a lot of information during that interaction. But those five people don't necessarily represent you know, how your broader audience is going to behave. And A-B testing is just a way of taking advantage of the fact that you have hundreds of thousands or millions of users out there and that you can observe directly how they're responding to your changes so that you can provide them the best experience possible. Step number three is constructing a hypothesis, which we talked about earlier. The next step is prioritize. You mentioned also this briefly at the beginning. Can you talk in more detail what prioritization encompasses in A-B testing? Sure. So this is a hard problem like it is for in any domain in a, in a large organization. And as I mentioned before, <clears throat> we're again coming back to this problem that there's, there's like a billion things you can test at any given point, right? There's always more ideas than there is capacity to execute on them in any context. And prioritization is as important in experimentation as it is in product development or marketing campaigns or anything else. And so some great ways to do that are uh, aligning with your organization, again, on what are those success metrics, right? So if we decide of all of the things we could possibly measure, these are the few numbers that we really care about the most. That's one way to really force prioritization. And then sitting down, coming up with a backlog of experiments, ranking them, for example, by expected impact on those metrics, and then using you know, maybe a series of open meetings and discussions to get the whole organization aligned on the, the, the roadmap for experimentation. Um, and we've seen it at really sophisticated organizations. This process is really merged tightly with actually the product backlog uh, process, right? And, and that's because it, is, it, becomes kind of, it becomes unheard of to launch something, especially something big, without running some kind of experiment. And so you've, you see at these uh, more sophisticated organizations, their experiment backlog really is their product backlog. And their experiment prioritization process is the same as their product prioritization process. What would you say are the groups in the organization involved in this prioritization? It sounds like there's engineers, but also maybe people in marketing or, sure. or so, managers, <clears throat> product managers. So we have seen uh, experimentation uh, really transform the way both marketing teams and product teams go about their work. And I think it's true that any team that works on some, some thing, uh, some digital experience, 
can benefit from this. And so I talk about these use cases as though they're separate because sometimes they are, right? You may have a team of marketers that's responsible for you know, the promotions on a landing page and then a separate team of engineers and product managers who are responsible for building a product that you're selling. Those at the end of the day are both digital experiments, uh, sorry, digital experiments, experiences, and they can both benefit from experimentation. The next step is about the test itself. We talked about how it's not recommended to just be throwing out there a lot of tests because real customers are seeing these different variations and there could be confusion of the product if it keeps changing constantly. If we assume we have a set of few tests that we are trying out, how do we decide when to finish running these tests? That's a really good question. So first I want to mention, I actually don't think it's a bad thing to run a lot of tests. I think it's a really good thing to run a lot of tests. What I think is bad is undisciplined testing or tests that experiments that don't have a reason for running, right? And this back to this idea of using well-qualified hypotheses to decide which experiments you run and which ones you don't. I think most, most websites run by large companies especially are, are changing constantly and users have kind of come to expect that. So it's, it's less a question of, of maybe too much change for a user, more a question of making sure that as an organization, you're focused on things that are gonna have an impact. Um, so that's, that's one. But your question was about how long you run an experiment. And this is a really, this is a question that we have spent a lot of time thinking about. And actually there are, there are some things in that book that I think are, are not correct, right? This was written in 2013 and we were a relatively young organization. And I think there were some things that we, that we didn't really understand or get right even at the time. And uh, one of the biggest areas where I think we made some mistakes here was in how we thought about and how we talked about statistics and specifically how you decide how long to run an experiment and whether or not you, um, you know, can draw some conclusion from it. And so I'll tell a story uh, about this. So the, the kind of the standard technique in the field uh, and, and well outside of just A-B testing, it's, it's widely used in the sciences as well, is, is something called a T-test. It's a fixed horizon approach to deciding how long to run an experiment. And the reason it's called fixed horizon is because you actually make the decision for how long to run the experiment before you started the experiment. And so this involves um, making essentially a prediction about the impact that experiment is going to have. So you say, uh, well, I, I predict this is going to have a, a you know, 3% impact on... Uh, on this particular metric. And so uh, then given that, that, that uh, the size of the effect that you want to detect, you then compute how many data points you need to, make, to draw a conclusion from that, and then you run the experiment for that long. And that's the, that is the correct approach to using a t-test. The challenge is that um, a lot of people who run experiments these days don't have a formal statistics background. And they're used to getting analytics and data in real time. And so the idea that you ought to sort of make this prediction and then come up with a fixed length uh, to run an experiment before you've collected any data is very counterintuitive. And that's dangerous because if you use the t-test but you don't follow those rules, then you actually are going to get a much higher error rate than you think you're going to. And that's uh, one of the mistakes we made uh, in that book in particular. Uh, was in not describing correctly how to use that t-test. And so this was something that, that, you know, me personally and a lot of folks at Optimize, they lost a lot of sleep over. And what we ended up deciding was that the t-test, so this standard accepted technique, was actually not really appropriate for use in a digital context unless you had a lot of expertise in how to use it and a lot of discipline. And so what we ended up doing was we launched something in, I think, early 2015 that we call Stats Engine. And that takes some more recent techniques, and, and by recent I mean from the last maybe 50 years versus yeah. the last 100 years, uh, takes some more recent techniques and uses them to come up with a analysis tools that allow our customers to check their results all the way through an experiment and make a decision as soon as, as, soon as excuse me, they have enough data to call a, a result significant. So we tried, to, uh, we tried to build an approach here that conformed more to the way users are used to working these days rather than trying to change our customers' behavior. So with the way this work is that they're constantly seeing the results and if they don't see they, they keep changing, they can call it a conclusion or something? Is that how it works? Yeah, so the, the, the way that you can look at um, the way that our results report works is you can see in real time 
uh, how your different variations in your experiments are performing. And on, in addition to that, right, you might see like I've got three variations and this one has a conversion rate of 3% and this one has a conversion rate of 4% and this one has a you know, conversion rate of 5%. Um, in addition to seeing those, uh, the, the performance numbers or the point estimates, uh, you can also see a set of statistical recommendations and that's in the form of error bars that try to give you an indication of the range where the true conversion rate lives. Uh, as well as a number we call statistical significance. And that statistical significance number will change in real time, right, as you collect more data. Uh, but once that crosses a, th a certain threshold, our users are okay to stop the experiment and draw a conclusion. And that's, the, that's really where the fundam fundamental difference is between our approach and the more traditional approach, is that using a more traditional approach, you can still calculate the significance numbers in real time and they're still going to fluctuate, but you're not allowed to use them to draw a conclusion until you've reached that predetermined sample size. And that's where most people get it wrong. I see. Let's talk about what happens after we finish doing an A-B test. For example, in, in what ways are these results used for maybe further testing and things like that? Are they used for that? So I think ideally they right a, a good A/B test ought to you know create more questions than it does answers right because you've ideally you've taken some hypothesis and you've either confirmed or denied that uh, or invalidated that hypothesis and that ought to lead you to a new set of questions like oh well if this worked what else will work you know what did we learn that helps inform maybe what we can do even better and if this didn't work what was wrong about our understanding right so back to that example of a you know a trying to collect camp, uh, donations to a political campaign, maybe you tried a set of headlines, maybe you tried a headline that you thought would resonate with voters, and maybe you got, you saw no significant difference, or, or you know, at, at worst, maybe, maybe it actually made things worse. So why did that happen, and how can you take that learning that you just got and use it to improve the experience even more? Since we've been talking about this donation example for a lot in yeah. this episode, were you the one that that worked on this, and for was it for the Obama campaign? No, no. so I, I can talk a bit about the history of the company. So uh, my co-founder and I started the company in, in 2010, and the real inspiration for uh, the you know the customer problem that we tried to solve actually came from my co-founder's experience on the uh, the the Obama campaign in 2008. So he and I met at Google. He left Google in late 07 and joined the Obama campaign. And it was there that he took this technique, which was used commonly at Google, and applied it in, uh, to a presidential campaign, uh, where it was really relatively unknown. And it, was, it had uh, a big impact uh, on the, the amount of donations they collected online. I mean, the campaign broke a lot of records there. Uh, but it was also it was kind of one of those things where I think what he took away from that was, wow, this was really powerful, but it sure was difficult to do. I wonder if we can make it easier. And that's where our inspiration came from for this company. Exactly. And like you said, both you and your co-founder had used this technique at Google. And a, a lot of these things start at big companies, but then the small companies don't have the resources to be doing this. So that's why it's important you know, to have companies like Optimizely that are making this techniques available to different kinds of products, right? That was, that was our thesis, right? And that's, that's certainly how we got our start. I would say today, we spend more time working with some of the largest organizations, right? We work with 26 out of the Fortune 100. And I think, I think there's something to the, like, maybe experimentation's hard, right? And that's, that, was, that was the thesis we had when we started the company. And our experience over the last nine years has only confirmed that. It's difficult. When we started, we were mostly focused on some of the technical challenges involved in running an experiment, right? We built this visual editor, this single line install. We made a lot of these hurdles smaller. Um, I think what we've learned over time is that there are just as many, if not more, organizational hurdles that a company has to go through to do this. Some of these questions about how you prioritize, you know, like the, what kind of team you need to build in order to do this, uh, in order to run the experiments, or to anal analyze them, these are all difficult, thorny questions that big companies have just as much trouble answering. And so our goal now is, when we, when we work with the company, is not just to provide software, it's to provide software, services, knowledge, and understanding, and how to build this into your culture. Exactly. And it's interesting that you bring that up because I sometimes see headlines on the, headlines on the news describing 
how users complain about a change in the product. I think there was one in, in Instagram recently where they made horizontal scrolling and it was just an experiment released by mistake to the the real users, a very broad set of them. Can you talk a bit about this, like determining who to release it to a test? You're not going to release it to to like half my users and the other half are going to see this, right? Yeah, so, so that can be sometimes a real challenge. And I loved your point about um, changes in a product kind of resulting in frustration amongst users because I think there's, there's just several really good examples over the last five years of companies that have maybe uh, skipped the process of, of experimentation and gathering real user feedback and have rolled out broadly changes that ended up having a hugely negative impact on their business. Snapchat comes to mind, I think. Yeah, that's another good point. Yeah. yeah. And and so, you know, I, we've used this example of, of collecting donations in a political campaign, but as I mentioned before, this is just as relevant in product development context, right? If you're going to invest months of, uh, you know, a software engineering team's time in building a feature, you should understand that that feature is going to be beneficial to your users and your company. And experimentation is a really good way to do that. So you ask, like, how do you determine in that context how who to who should see uh, who should see the you know a particular feature? Um, there's different ways of doing it. The the easiest way is just say, you know, I'm just going to carve out maybe five percent, ten percent, fifty percent, whatever it is, and show it to them. Sometimes it's not always that easy, and there's interesting cases where. Uh, where you actually you can't just be as naive about that. So another you know maybe a, a classic case where this is where this is the case is testing with price. You know it's this can be a very sensitive thing is showing one price to one user and another price to other users. In some contexts it, it can even be illegal. And so um, these are all things you have to take into account. Uh, there's other interesting thing um, interesting complications that come in when you've got a, you know a business with large network effects. Um, so you know I've, I've spoken a lot to the team at Airbnb, for example. Uh, they run a ton of experiments, and some of the things they have to take into account are, you know, if they run a big experiment on a set of hosts, uh, then um, yeah, if they run a big experiment on a set of hosts, then uh, that the the changes they make to those set of hosts may impact the users, the end users, uh, or so the I guess the guests, uh, the guests' behavior. And those guests uh, then may be interacting with some hosts that are in the treatment and some hosts that are not in the treatment. And so you get these, um, you can no longer assume that all of your data points are independent, which then throws your results into question. So they have to spend a lot of time actually designing their, t their sample groups, you know, taking this into, into account. Uh, so I've seen some, some uh, organizations solve this problem uh, by, for example, uh, isolating only particular cities to expose things to, um, you know, or particular markets where you can be relatively sure that changes you make within that market may have effects within that market, but aren't going to, you know, if you make a change to your your product that only folks on the East Coast see, it, you may may have less of a chance of impacting the behavior on the West Coast, and so you isolate your changes that way. So there's a whole kind of science behind how you how you best pick a sample group. Okay, let's. Go back a little bit to this, the way in which A-B testing can be used in products. Like you mentioned, some companies release a major design without having run, you know, shorter experiments about it. We can test a major redesign at scale, I guess, before we build it, because then we already invested resources in building it. How can we justify investing resources in a major redesign? that we later find did worse? That's a good, well, a, a lot of companies seem to do it. So I, you know, there must be a way. But so how can, you, how can you justify spending resources on a major redesign that may make the experience, experience worse for users? There's a couple approaches you can take to mitigate risk. And a lot of, I think, testing in a, in a product context is about risk mitigation. It's about making sure that the effort you spend on your product actually results in an improvement. And uh, one approach that we've seen are, is something called a painted door test, where it's, it's called painted door after, you know, the old uh, Looney Tunes cartoons where, uh, you know, the, someone would paint a door on a rock and it looks like a door, but it's not actually a yeah. door. Uh, you know, and a classic example of this is, is you know, you, you just put a link for like, try this new feature. And then when the user clicks on it, 
uh, it says, okay, coming soon, you know, let us know if you're interested in this, where it's a really low effort way to gauge whether there's demand for something that you're thinking about building. Um, you can test smaller subcomponents. So if you're doing a major redesign, uh, take some smaller components and test those first, right? Maybe, the, maybe in, in areas where it's, it's you know, going to be a little safer to do so. It'll have less of an impact on your business. And hopefully you can do that in a way that, uh, where you, you kind of front load the experiments so that you can decide, you know, if, you know, should you continue the project or should you make changes to it. But in the, in the worst case, it's, you know, if, let's say it's something that you truly can't experiment on until after you've invested months or years of effort into doing it. I still think it's worth running that experiment because the alternative is, is potentially something that looks like what Snapchat ended up doing, which was to launch a major set of changes without having run, that, run those experiments. And it's had a huge impact on their business. And so even if you've invested all of that time, and, and the, that, you know, wouldn't you want to know the impact was going to be negative before you rolled it out. It still would have been better to say, okay, nuts to this, we're gonna do something else, than it was to roll that out, in my view. So you're saying it's definitely doable if we dissect the, the major design idea and we can test some components or add like sneak peeks. I think there are ways to front load the, your experimentation to try and, try and reduce risk up front, absolutely. I mean, user groups, like the, the, the men, you, you, user studies, focus groups, those are another way of, of, of collecting that kind of data early on. And uh, at the end of the day, all of this is really, again, about learning about your customers. And as a product manager, you ought to be making every attempt to do that before you invest effort like this. Let's talk a bit more about implementing A-B testing. For example, there are different ways that you can go about doing it. We first talk about the, the old way where it's in-house, you have dedicated engineers. You can also hire somebody to do the testing for you. I'm thinking you hire a different company to do it. You can build your own tool. You can buy an existing tool. What do you recommend for organizations that are just starting to explore it, this idea of A-B testing? Uh, for an organization that's really just starting to explore it, and I think the implementation at that point is, is less important than starting to build some cultural momentum around it. And so there's, we've seen many examples where experimenta a program, an experimentation program inside an organization will start because some team has run some experiment that ends up being really successful and, and ends up you know, changing the course of, of the product direction or, or you know, giving, giving some big yield, right? And that example ends up getting enough attention internally that there's a lot of interest that grows around it. And something like that is usually necessary in order to start building support for investing larger resources in building a larger program. And so I, I actually think you were right that there are, you know, um, you can use something like Optimize that you can use, but there are, you know, a, a number of competitors of ours offer products. There are some open source implementations. You can even build your own, although that's something that usually takes a lot more effort, yeah. which I wouldn't recommend if you're just dipping your toe into the water. But the important thing is uh, you find meaningful experiments to run. Uh, that end up setting a great example for the rest of your organization because that's what really builds momentum. And then once you've gotten that momentum, then you can start to think, okay, how do we scale this and how do we build a program that makes it easy, as, as easy as possible for many of our other teams in the company to run those experiments. So a way that I see this starting is first make sure you already have metrics from your product and then start thinking about those numbers and asking questions like, why aren't we really seeing signups and that kind of stuff, right? Start having questions that you, you're just trying to figure out what the answer is. That's a really good way to start any experiment is just, what are, what are the biggest questions that we have, right? I, th I think there's a, there's a great, going back to this kind of moment where experimentation explodes within an organization, there's a really good example. In the early days of Uber, I spoke to some, some former Uber employees and who told me the story. In the early days of Uber, they had to make a decision on uh, launching uh, cash payments in, in India. And the team on the ground in India wanted to accept cash because it's a, it's a, you know, cash plays a really important role in that economy still. But management uh, in the U.S. didn't want to do that. And so there was a, kind of this back and forth. And so the team on the ground decided to run an experiment. They figured out a kind of low-cost way of building cash payments. And they did that. They ran this experiment. And they showed 
that when you exposed riders to the option of paying with cash, they signed up at a higher rate and then they retained at a much higher rate as well. And so the results were really dramatic and that ended up getting the management uh, team in the US to change their view and they ended up launching cash payments uh, in India and elsewhere. And that that example got at so much attention inside the company that that was then that ended up being the motivation for building their own experimentation platform internally and a team around it. Yeah, that's a that's a really good story. I didn't know about it. I want to talk now specifically about Optimizely, which is a platform to do experimentation. Earlier, you mentioned some of its components. Can you give an overview of about what a tool like Optimizely looks like? Can I give an overview on what a tool like Optimizely looks like? Yeah, or what are some of the things that you can do? Sure, sure. So we have, our product is really broken down in several parts. Our, our kind of our two flagship products are a product we call Optimizely Web and another one we call Optimizely Full Stack. And Optimizely Web is built for non-technical and semi-technical users to run experiments on web pages. And that includes this visual you know, WYSIWYG editor that I mentioned before. It's often used by marketing teams to do things like optimize landing pages, uh, home pages. Our other product that I mentioned is called Full Stack, and that is targeted much more towards product development teams and software engineers. And so rather than using a visual editor, you are using a set of, I think, 11 open source SDKs, which you embed in your product. And the idea is you should be able to run experiments anywhere that you run code. And you can use the combination of the SDK along with our web interface to configure a set of experiments or feature flags that you then use to, to configure how your product Uh, shows up to users and you can collect data using these experiments. You can turn features on and off. You can slowly ramp them up from zero to 100%. And all of this is designed to help you uh, use data and, and science to, to decide how to develop your products. We also have a product we call Program Management, which instead of being focused on actually building and executing experiments, helps organizations plan and manage the process of running experiments. So you uh, can manage all of the teams that are running experiments. They keep a backlog of ideas. They can stack rank them and vote on them. As an administrator or a program manager, you get a bird's eye view of everything that's going on in your organization. Do we have to build our applications and our products to be A-B test friendly? Is there such a thing? That's a, that's a really good question. So I think That is something I advise. I don't think it's required, right? But anything as a, as a product development team that you can do to make product development easier, whether it's experimentation or something else, I think is a good idea. And so, you know, one, one, of, the, one of the ways that you can do this, I mentioned before, you can use our SDKs to run experiments inside your products. And, and the way that that's actually done is using conditional logic uh, and our, our SDK to say, if the user's bucketed into variation A versus variation B, show this versus this. We actually expose something that we call, I think live variables is the name we use. And that is, it gives you the ability to define a set of variables, which you can then using our interface, give different values to in different variations. So you might, you know, say like number of search results in variation one should be five, but in variation two should be 10. And one way to make it very easy to, to design and run these experiments is to separate the configuration of a given feature from the business logic of that feature. And it, once you've done that, you can connect that configuration, so all of these kind of variable values that are important to how the feature uh, runs, to a tool like Optimizely, where you can then, once you've done that, run an arbitrary number of experiments on what those values should be. So I, I used the, you know, the, the example before of the number of search results that appear on a search results page, but you might also use right, the, the size of the links, um, you know, the, you know, the gravity constant in a game. Right? There's a, any number of things that you could then use once you use this, um, this design pattern to experiment and, and figure out the best configuration for your product. Where does the decision of what variation of a page to serve happen? Does this occur on the client side or on the server side? With, the, with our full stack product? Yeah. This, this, this actually happens, it can, it's up to you as, okay. as a software engineer. So um, you, know, you can use our C-sharp SDK, for example, 
or, or node SDK to run experiments where the bucketing decision and that logic happens on the server side before the request is served. Uh, you can also use uh, a, an SDK on the client, whether it's a, you know, an, an iPhone or an Android application or a web page. Uh, we offer SDKs for those environments as well. Uh, you can use those to execute uh, a, that decision on the client side as well. And so it ends up becoming more of an architecture decision. You can also use multiple SDKs in concert with each other. They all consume the same data file. And so um, you, it's really up to you to, to architect your approach in the way that makes the most sense for a given experiment. Are there trade-offs between the two, doing it on the client side versus on the server side? Absolutely. So the, as with anything on the client side, it involves, it involves more, sending more data over the, over the wire in one way or another, and that can have a latency impact. Um, uh, specifically with web pages, for example, if you are making changes to the DOM as the page is loading, it's not only a matter of, of having to download more data to the user's browser, but it's a matter of making changes uh, using JavaScript as the page is being rendered, which, can, uh, which has cost as well. You can make those decisions using full stack on the server side, and that's, uh, it's much faster. There's, there's you know, almost zero latency impact. Uh, but in most cases, that involves more work as well, right? It's often easier within an organization to make changes to client-side code than it is server-side code for a bunch of reasons. I see. Because like you said, maybe the, it sounds like if it's in the client side, it can be faster to implement it, but it can have performance impacts on on the user. That's usually the trade-off we see. And there's ways to manage that performance impact, but it ultimately comes down to a question of uh, you know, velocity versus, versus latency yeah. and, and needing to make the decision in the way that's best for your users, your organization. Yeah, yeah. because you, you might decide, oh, if it increases the time to load from one second to one and a half seconds. And may, maybe you're like, I, I don't think that will impact our users, how they perceive the product, and then we can just finish this A-B test. That's exactly right. That's, that's exactly what I think about it. I, I think um, you know, understanding that impact and then deciding, okay, is it worth taking that hit to latency uh, you know, for the next two weeks while we gather enough data and make a decision? Or should we instead our, build this on the, on the server side? And I mentioned before, I, I should clarify, a velocity versus latency. When I say velocity in this context, I mean the velocity of your experimentation. Right. Um, if you, the easier it is to to build and run an experiment, the more you can run, the faster you can run them, versus uh, versus the latency of the user experience. A/B testing is not only about testing changes in the UI, which we've been talking about throughout this conversation. What are server side changes that can be A/B tested? Sure. So I, I gave that example before of um, you know the the number of search results that might appear on a search results page. But the, 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 the things that you can test are just vast, right? You might test the different responses in an Alexa app you know, or a chatbot. Uh, you might test price, you know, which is, is something that's often easier to do on the server side. Really, any business logic that you execute on the server side are things you can experiment with in full stack. And that's what makes it so powerful. Can this be also about A-B testing different implementations of, of your APIs. For example, if you have, you're using C Sharp and then you're like, oh, let's just use Node to serve this. And is it also in that context? Sure. So that's, that's another really good one is understanding the trade-offs between two different implementations of some API. Uh, it's it's maybe, uh, maybe you're trying to improve your, the latency of your you know, query processor and uh, you've, you've, you've built a new version and you want to understand its performance relative to the old version. Uh, one way to do that is just send 10% of queries to the new version and use an experiment to measure. And, right? and as you see promising results, then you can increase the percentage of queries that go to your your new version, and and then you've got it. Even even something as, as simple as you know making sure that your your code is actually doing what you think it should be doing, right? So every feature has bugs in it in in one way or another. And if you decide to roll out a new feature to a small percentage of users, you can limit the blast radius of those of the bugs. And that's in it in a way that's that's just an experiment. It's something you can do with. Uh, optimizely, you know, or another feature flagging tool. At what scale does a company need to be operating for it to start doing A-B tests? Good question. I mean, I, you know, I don't think there's a concrete answer to that. You do, as I mentioned before, you need enough data 
to be able to make meaning, you know, to make the effort required to run an experiment worth it. Uh, and I don't have a hard and fast number there even. Um, I will suggest that if you have, if you have a, if you're just getting started out, like I mentioned before, I think you're probably going to get a lot more mileage out of conversations with your customers, right? As a, as an entrepreneur, it's something we learned over and over again. But if you if you do want to run an A/B test, and I've seen good examples of people running good A/B tests, even a smaller size, focus on changes that you think are going to have a big impact, right? Like, again, this this sort of nonsense example of you know testing the blue button versus the green button. I think it's a waste of time at any size, but particularly if you're a tiny company and you don't have many customers, like, you know, if you're going to run an experiment run it on something big that you think is going to have a big impact because the bigger the effect, the easier it is to, te- to detect with less data. I see. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the ethical concerns of doing A-B testing. These can arise depending on how we set up our experiments. One example that I could think of was Facebook's ex- experiment of showing users more positive or negative posts where do we draw the line of what's ethical in A-B testing or how can we have that conversation within an organization? That's a really good question. And that's, that's an, a question every organization really, I think, needs to ask and answer for themselves because the, the ethical concerns don't stop with an experiment, right? They stop anytime you're building any kind of product that has an impact on your users' lives. And Facebook has, has found itself in the position where they can have a huge impact on society. And and they're having to tackle some of these these questions now. You know, I don't I don't know if I have a hard and fast answer for this, right? It's at Optimizely, um, we we spend a lot of time thinking about our culture and our values, and we're very intentional about those things. We wrote them down very early, and um, and even today they play a big part in how we operate as a business. And you know, I personally think it's very important to take a principled stand to what it means to be a high integrity business, a high integrity company. And hopefully, uh, if you've been intentional enough about your values, and if you, if you really, as, as a leadership team, set the example of living by them, then those decisions become a bit easier. But again, this be- ends up becoming something that every company really needs to decide for themselves. Yeah. The way I see this going, adding on to what you mentioned earlier, that the first step is to have this culture of testing in the organization. I see this just being yet another component of this culture of testing, like, the hypotheses, and then we can also have a section of what it ca- can be, you know, negative impacts of this or ethical questions. That, that's how I see it going. Yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, I, I, the, I, I, I don't know the details of the, of the Facebook case that you mentioned, but I, I think it had something to do with making some changes, uh, as you mentioned, that, that had a more positive slant to your newsfeed versus a more negative slant. And you know, again, I don't think this is really a question about the the ethics of experimentation because these are these are decisions that Facebook has to make no matter what, yeah. and the process of of gathering data and and understanding what that impact is is something that hopefully will inform a decision. Mm-hmm. Maybe the best way for uh, ensuring that you are running these kinds of experiments in service of good is to uh, is to decide intentionally up front how will we use this data to make the best decision possible for our customers mm-hmm. right if it turns out that you know making the news feed uh, is more negative results in more engagement but is you know is has harmful effects then that's something that ought to be discussed long before that we start collecting that data. And we ought to know, okay, once we collect this data and once we understand this, the answer to this question, how will we use that to make a decision about the experiments? Because that's, that's what really matters. What are some of the steps to start creating a culture of testing in an organization? Uh, what, are, what are some of the steps to start creating a culture of experimentation? Like if, if there's somebody listening from in a small company or a medium company and they're like, we're not doing any testing. We're, we're just building stuff and not getting as much as ga- engagement as we could. Yeah. How can they go about suggesting this or yeah. getting started on? So, well, one way I mentioned earlier is just by running good experiments and talking about them in an organization. I mean, that's that's just the key to building in you know a curiosity, excitement, momentum around this idea. But sooner or later, you really need to have a leadership team that is bought into this. And if you do, that's great, right? That's, um, 
that to me is a strong sign that you've got a good leadership team in place. But uh, one way that leaders can contribute to building this culture of experimentation that it costs almost nothing to do, but it's so impactful, is just to ask about experiment results. So I've, I've spoken to folks at organizations where it is unheard of to launch something without experiment results. And that's because product leadership always asks, what did you learn in your experiment in the, in the launch reviews? And so once, once it, you sort of establish that, that precedent and that expectation that you better come armed, to, you better come to these discussions armed with data, uh, then that's how your that's how your employees start behaving, and so that I think is yeah start by generating excitement, but you focus on getting your leadership team on board and having them adopt the practices that set an example for the for the broader organization. Well, Pete, thank you for taking the time to come on the show and talk about A/B testing. It's been a great conversation. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it too. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.